On November 22, 1963, President John F. Kennedy was killed in Dallas, Texas. Although the nation would never forget that terrible day, few bear the scars as deeply as those who witnessed it. These are their stories. Dallas native Janice Gush was only 14 years old when President John F. Kennedy was killed. Although she was too young to vote, she was nonetheless an admirer of the handsome young president and his glamorous socialite wife. On the morning of the president's arrival, Gush and her friends skipped school and positioned themselves along the parade route. Gush told ABC News, It was such an impulsive thing. We both had pink rollers the size of orange juice cans in our hair. We had no makeup and were right there on the curb as the motorcade came by. Gosh, there were just so much clapping and applaud, you know, just people waving, and they seemed like they were happy. Gush came within feet to the president and the first lady, close enough to notice JFK's bushy eyebrows and that Jackie Kennedy's lipstick perfectly matched her pink outfit and hat. She remembered, we could have reached out and touched them if we wanted to. Still buzzing from their brush with the Kennedys, Gush and a friend headed to a nearby drugstore where they noticed a distraught woman sobbing in her car. Gush approached the crying woman, who told her the president had been shot. Gush recalled, it was like a moment frozen in time. It was so quiet, and I looked at the store manager, and she had tears running down her face. I remember putting my hands on my face and felt the tears. How could that have happened? I was heart sick. The Chisholm family, John, Marvin, Faye, and their three-year-old son, Rick, were in downtown Dallas on a shopping trip. Little Rick needed a new pair of shoes. At the last minute, they decided to watch the president and first lady pass. By happenstance, the Chisholms found themselves in the crowd on Elm Street directly in front of the Texas School Book Depository. In a 2013 interview with the New York Post, Marvin Faye Chisholm recalled the afternoon of the day she came to remember as the worst of her life, saying, I was standing in front of the book depository and the shots came over my head. Like many witnesses, Mrs. Chisholm initially thought the shots were firecrackers until she saw the bullet strike Kennedy. In the ensuing chaos, John Chisholm heard someone say the assassin was on the train tracks. Hoping to catch the gunman, he made a dash for the grassy knoll, only to be tackled by what he believed to be Secret Service agents. Chisholm and his family were taken to the police station and detained for 12 hours. The assassination had a lasting impact on Rick Chisholm despite his young age. As he told the Daily Campus, For a long time I had this dream of somebody getting killed in a car, but I never knew what it was until I was 13 years old. Orville Nix, a 52-year-old maintenance man employed at Dallas' Terminal Annex building, was waiting to meet his wife, daughter-in-law, and granddaughter when he captured one of the most important and controversial pieces of film in American history. Positioned opposite Dealey Plaza's now infamous grassy knoll on the corner of Main and Houston Street and armed with his Keystone movie camera, Nix filmed the driver's side perspective of the presidential limousine as the assassination unfolded. Government sources now confirm that President Kennedy is dead. Until his death in 1972, Nix maintained that the shots came not from the book depository, but from the fence at the crest of the grassy knoll. Nick's friend Forrest Sorrells, Secret Service Special Agent in charge of the Dallas District who was positioned in the back seat of the car immediately in front of the presidential limousine, was among those who concurred with Nix's assessment. Nix's copy of the film and his camera were confiscated by the FBI. According to Nix, the film returned to him appeared to have been altered. The original film, which Nix sold to United Press International for $5,000, was given to the United States government and has remained missing since its use in the 1978 House Select Committee on Assassinations. Along with the famous Zabruder film, Nix's footage was instrumental in the Warren Commission's investigation of the assassination. Ricky Mormon, age 11, wanted to see the presidential motorcade wind through downtown Dallas, but Friday, November 22nd, was a school day. As a consolation, his mother, Mary Ann Mormon, promised to snap a photo of the president. Mormon and her friend Jean Hill found the perfect vantage point to watch a procession pass through Dealey Plaza. Standing just feet from the curb directly opposite the grassy knoll, Mormon and Hill would have an unobstructed view of the presidential limousine. The friends were excited to see the handsome young president up close. As the motorcade approached, the cheering got louder. Anxiously, she readied her camera. In a 2013 interview with the New York Post, Mormon recalled what happened next, saying, As the car turned the corner and came down past us, Jean hollered, Mr. President, look this way, we want to take your picture and I put the camera up and snapped the picture when I thought he was looking at me. Mormon, shown here in a still frame of the home movie famously shot by Abraham Zapruder, took just one photograph of the president that day. An unwitting witness to history, Mormon captured the moment Kennedy was struck by the fatal bullet. Years later, she would tell documentary filmmaker Alan Govner that at first she thought there had been a gust of wind because she saw Kennedy's hair lift. She had no idea that what she was photographing was the assassination of the President of the United States. Then she heard the First Lady scream. Mormon told PBS, Jackie hollered, my God, he's been shot. We heard that so plain. The afternoon of November 22, 1963, began on a note of inconvenience for James Tay. 
A 27-year-old car salesman from Euless, Texas, was in Dallas to meet his girlfriend for lunch, but the president's visit had caused traffic through Dealey Plaza to grind to a standstill. Since it was apparent he was going nowhere for a while, Tig parked his car and stood near a bridge abutment to watch the motorcade. As the procession drew near, he heard a noise similar to a firecracker. In 2013, just a year before his death, Tig recalled what happened next in an interview with KXAS-TV, saying, I'm standing there in disbelief at somebody throwing a firecracker, then crack, crack, two rifle shots about a second apart and something stings me in the face. A bullet intended for Kennedy had struck a nearby curb, spraying Tig with fragments of concrete and lead. Realizing he was in the line of fire, he quickly dove for cover. Tig's injury and the damage to the nearby curb were instrumental in investigators' determination that the shots had come from the school book depository and that one round had missed the motorcade entirely. At the time of the assassination, Dallas police officer Robert W. Hargis was riding his motorcycle at the left rear side of Kennedy's limousine. In a 1973 interview, the former patrolman recalled that the route from Love Field to Dealey Plaza was so packed with spectators, the entire motorcycle section, part of the local security contingent, was forced to fall back behind the Secret Service car. It wasn't until the motorcade turned from Main onto Elm Street that Hargis was able to assume his assigned position. As the procession turned left in the direction of the triple overpass, Hargis heard the first shot. A year before his death, Hargis related his perspective of the assassination in the Dutch documentary Back into the Left, escorting JFK, saying, Within five seconds, that second shot hit the president in the head, and a plume of bloody matter went up and I rode right through it. Soon after, a friend noticed that Hargis was covered in gore. As Hargis remembered, A buddy asked me, You got something on your lip? And picked it off, and it was a piece of the president's skull bone in his brains. I noticed that I had it all over my uniform. I felt bad about that. For decades identified in photos only as the girl in blue, Tony Glover didn't come forward with her story until 1995. Just 11 years old at the time of the assassination, Glover was standing on a stone pedestal in Dealey Plaza across the street from the school book depository as the president's motorcade passed. I was five feet higher than anyone else, determined to watch that car every second I possibly could. Glover came from a troubled home, and she fantasized that if she could get JFK to wave or look at her, it would mean that he knew she existed. She remembered her hope. No one would hurt a kid that Kennedy knew. When interviewed by The Morning Call, Glover shared, I went there with this magical thinking that just a wave and a smile would change my life forever. And he did indeed look up and smile and wave, and it took my breath away. I was just floating on air, so I just kept watching the car as it went down the street, and his head exploded. Now, you'll excuse me if I am out of breath. A bulletin. This is from the United Press from Dallas. President Kennedy and Governor John Colony have been cut down by assassin's bullets in downtown Dallas. Glover, now an English professor at the University of Scranton, struggled with depression for decades after witnessing the assassination. Tina Towner, 13, stood across the street from the Texas School Book Depository with her mother Pat and father James Towner. Tina was tasked with capturing the motorcade with her father's 8mm movie camera. So Tina, intent on getting the best footage possible, was too consumed with operating the camera to get excited about the president and first lady. As the procession moved out of her field of vision, Tina Towner stopped filming. No sooner had Towner lowered the movie camera when she was startled by a sound she assumed was firecrackers. Recognizing the sound of gunfire, a quick-thinking stranger pulled the teen to the ground. Towner's film documenting the moments just before the assassination continues to reveal clues about the fateful day. In 2012, she wrote a book about her experience titled Tina Towner, My Story as the Youngest Photographer of the Kennedy Assassination. James Towner avoided talking about the assassination for the rest of his life. Dressed in their Sunday best, Bill and Gail Newman made a day of seeing the Kennedy motorcade with their young sons Billy and Clayton. Their day started at Love Field, where they saw the Kennedys disembark from Air Force One. They decided to go downtown afterward to catch the motorcade and ended up in Dealey Plaza. Fate would place the Newmans mere feet from the motorcade, making them the closest civilian witnesses to Kennedy's assassination. It was just, just right by us when it all happened, just right in front of us. In a 2018 interview with the Hot Springs Village Voice, Bill Newman said, Just as the car passed in front of us, the third shot rang out, and I remember seeing the side of President Kennedy's head blow off. I didn't know what was going on, so I just grabbed the boy and fell on him in the hopes that there wasn't a maniac around. Believing themselves to be in the line of fire, the Newmans dove to the ground, shielding their sons with their bodies. Paul Landis was one of the Secret Service agents on duty that fateful day in Dallas, and the events that unfolded under the wide Texas sky were so traumatic that within a year he had left the service. He didn't speak about what happened for decades, and when he released his memoir in late 2023, what he shared wasn't a rehashing of the same oft-told tale. In fact, it was pretty shocking. According to Landis, the so-called magic bullet theory wasn't so magic after all. Rather than the long-accepted and widely implausible theory that the same bullet that killed JFK also hit Texas Governor John Conley Jr. multiple times, 
Landis said that he actually plucked a bullet from the seat in front of Kennedy and behind Connolly. Landis grabbed the bullets when they'd already reached the hospital because he didn't want it to fall into the hands of someone looking for a souvenir. People were pushing and shoving, and I just got shoved right up against the examination table. He put it on the stretcher by JFK and says that what happened to it after that is speculation. In an interview with the New York Times, Landis said, There was nobody there to secure the scene, and that was a big, big bother to me. So it was, Paul, you've got to make a decision, and I grabbed it. The implications are staggering. Landis says he always believed Oswald acted alone, but the presence of the bullet that wouldn't have hit Connolly has caused him to question the official story. 